Gather round, my friends, for I shall tell you a tale. Many years ago, a young monk went to a local store to pick out a game for its PlayStation. Initially, he wanted to get something simple. But that monk's father told him, don't settle with a kid's game, get something more advanced. After some thought, he picked out something that he thought would be more advanced. That game was Final Fantasy VIII. The Final Fantasy series as a whole has been an instrumental part in my development as both a gamer and an amateur designer, especially the ones that are considered unpopular by many. Because of that, this is a difficult piece for me. There is no way for me to do so without having the appearance of bias, especially with how everyone has their pecking order with the games and will not hesitate to tell you so. God knows I'm no exception to that rule. But I will do my best to shelve that for the purposes of this presentation. With that said, let's talk a bit about Final Fantasy XV. But first, we need to segue a bit into the past. Specifically, the year 2006. If you can make yourself more than just a man, if you devote yourself to an idea, if they can stop you, then you become something else entirely. It was at this time that Square announced an ambitious project, Fabula Nova Crystallis, Latin for New Tale of the Crystals. The intent was to create a series of games connected with a central mythos, building on previous multimedia projects like the compilation of Final Fantasy VII and the Ivalice Alliance. The intent was to have a mythology they could base a series of games around, each connected through themes and illusions rather than outright continuity. Sadly, the project slowly fell apart with time, and many of the themes and ideas distributed piecemeal. At the end of it, it seemed to go in many places and lacked a clear direction, and if the postmortem for Final Fantasy XIII is an indication, that feeling was present behind the scenes as well. There's no definitive answer to why it didn't work, but I'll save my own theories for down the line. Originally, the game that would become known as Final Fantasy XV was going to be Versus XIII, a thematic yin to XIII's yang. But as with all ideas, time and development changes things. I'd say that the 15 that was released as we now know it is less of a yin-yang and more of a ritual burning of the Fabula Nova Crystallis idea as a whole. And as an aside, it's an amusing coincidence that FF14, their second attempt at an online game, was both terrible and got better after it went through a similar cleansing by fire. The idea of fire as a cleanser is one of removing old weights to heal and or allow enlightenment be it in the form of Agni or Baptism by Fire. In this way, FF15 is cleansing itself of the weight of the Fabula Nova Crystallis project and delivering a statement of new intent. A point of comparison could easily be made with what Scream did for the horror genre, for better or for worse in that case. Now the first reason for this is obvious. The public needed to be excited about the franchise again, needed to see it grow and change that it had done for over 25 years. Moreover, it needed to regain the goodwill that it lost from the failings of the FNC in general, and specifically the trilogy referred to as the Lightning Saga. If the series was going to reach any heights, it needed to brush off the stigma those games had created for an entire console generation. The second is one of design more than public appearance. A major failing in 13's DNA was an attempt to ape notes from PC-style design. Now let me be clear, there is nothing wrong with the idea of taking inspiration from others on its own. The problem in this case lay in the method, and the signs were there from the get-go. To use one example, Yoichi Wada's public defense of foreign games like Call of Duty, which for the purposes of context Square had a hand in the Japanese release of Modern Warfare 2. Hindsight is 2020, but it puts into perspective the chapter-based story and oft-maligned linearity, given that the Call of Duty series features a lot of moment-to-moment -moment set pieces. Another example would be scenario designer Toriyama referencing both the Elder Scrolls and Red Dead Redemption around the time 13.2 was making the rounds. Given that, I can easily see them trying to implement these design choices without figuring out how to integrate them into the mythos they built up over the years. Effectively, the project was trying to put a round peg in a square hole. It doesn't help that this was at a time when the JRPG-WRPG debate was at its most prevalent, and, in my not-so-humble opinion, most irritating. In the interest of time, I'll only say that that debate was a measure of dicks than anything else, but I've already covered that in one of my previous musings. All in all, it was more than just the association with subpar games that had to go. The modes of thinking present in the role design had to go to make way for something new. Final Fantasy's greatest strength has been its willingness to experiment with itself over the years. 
And in its own way, the FNC project worked against that by limiting how Mythos could be used for each individual game. This is because each game had to effectively work alongside the backbone of the FNC, rather than being its own thing entirely with nods to the greater Mythos. In some cases, this resulted in repeating previous points, or in other cases, just complete retreads altogether. Thus, the Baptism by Fire needed to get rid of this backbone in order for it to craft its identity once again. Not just being Final Fantasy with these PC-style things attached, but being Final Fantasy. Definitely and definitively. While 15 may have shook off the baggage as best it could, some subtextual elements remained. The biggest one was that of fate, specifically the gods dictating fates onto specific people, who have been granted gifts to see that fate through, though at a price. The second theme still present is that of the inevitable end. In 15, this is present overtly by the use of Niflheim as a villainous force in the game, and covertly with the Star Scourge phenomenon that plays a part in the last end of the tale. However, even with that DNA, great efforts were made to separate it from the approaches the FNC had with those same concepts. This didn't always work, as it's clear that some aspects are left unexplored or create clear narrative holes, but it ultimately equates to playing the theatrical version of something that probably could have done with a director's cut, in a manner of speaking. Ultimately, FF15 is a tale of male bonding. Even though it could be said that several of the characters are one note, they express that one note in such a way that it complements each other naturally. Because of that, I can't deny that playing the game felt like experiencing a journey with these four, through its highs and lows and annoying side quests. What also helps is that, unlike many squad-based action games, your allies are like an extra weapon to take advantage of instead of a mere burden. It's that mix of narrative and mechanic that I always enjoy. It's this strength of interaction that's able to make up for the shortcomings that were present. In other words, the story may not be perfect, but the heart of the story manages to shine through. That's probably why in the booklet that came along with the game, there's a thank you note with a bunch of signatures from the staff and producers on it. While certainly a great game on its own, FF15 is more of a statement of intent. It's a declaration to the world of how the franchise may look in the future, how it may sound, how it may act, how they intend to make careful note of its past while also continuing to experiment with the mythos they've created for over 25 years. And I for one am looking forward to what this new status quo will birth in the coming years.